Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Tuesday, July 7th, 2015, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. Tonight. So with the additional steps I ordered last month, we're speeding up training of ISIL forces. We're speeding up training of ISIL forces. Oops, was that a Freudian slip or admitting what we already know? And the illegal immigrant murderer says he picked San Francisco because it was a sanctuary city. All that and more on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. Ideologies are not defeated with guns. They're defeated by better ideas, a more attractive and more compelling vision. Better ideas will defeat ISIS? That's Obama's plan for defeating ISIS. Maybe you should have thought about that before flooding the Middle East with guns. Now, as we have documented time and time again, U.S. weapons are falling into the hands of ISIS, if not by accidental airdrops, then via this insane policy of arming and training so-called moderate rebels in Syria and Iraq and Libya. Now, if you don't want to believe us, you know, you don't, don't got to take our word for it. Here's a fact that was reported by the New York Times. Um, they're reporting that the CIA shipped weapons to Al-Qaeda affiliated groups in Syria since at least 2012. Iraqi intelligence has also claimed that the U.S. is intentionally dropping weapons to known ISIS linked groups of rebels and, of course, we've reported as well that there have been training bases there in Jordan. ISIS was trained uh, in Jordan as early as 2012. Those reports are coming out. So, I mean, here we have this again and again. Where were those better ideas when they actually mattered before you were actually training and helping ISIS on their little terror storm? So some people on Twitter have a few ideas. They are suggesting maybe we can counter this ISIS propaganda via some South Park memes. Okay. <laughs> and Caleb Howe has some better ideas for ISIS. He says, when you want to throw someone off of a roof, try making a paper airplane. They go farther and recapture your whimsy. And Market Runner says, instead of turning old pots into IEDs, make beautiful Ramadan planters for your favorite imam. So... <laughs> These are just some suggestions here for, for dealing with ISIS, and it goes on and on. Plenty of other Twitter users also point out how, you know, not a single tyrannical regime in the past was toppled with good ideas. But this is what happens when you have a president who used to be a community organizer. So whether or not you believe any of this, the fact is ISIS already has U.S. weapons. We're not going to be toppling this regime with better ideas. That doesn't really sound like a plan for countering ISIS. But in a Freudian slip or a somewhat lucid moment of truth telling, Obama basically slipped up and told us what, all what we already know. So with the additional steps I ordered last month, we're speeding up training of ISIL forces, including volunteers from Sunni tribes in Anbar province. But of course, the White House covered Obama's tracks once again, covering up that little blooper he made during his press briefing yesterday. They've done this countless times, but you can look at the transcript that was left in the original quote, uh, but then they placed the word Iraqi in brackets after the word ISIL. So they're like, come on, you guys, you know that's what he meant to say is that we're training the Iraqi forces, not <laughs> training ISIL. But one thing that Obama certainly isn't going to be defeating with good ideas is this problem that we're having with illegal immigration. In fact, the Democratic campaign to rela relax national, local, and state deportation policies is fueling outrage, having the exact opposite effect. And of course, all of this has been ignited by the shocking slaying of a woman in San Francisco. Uh, she was shot and killed by an illegal immigrant who has seven felony convictions. He had been deported five times. This is Juan Francisco Lopez Sanchez, and he said he chose San Francisco because he knew that it was a sanctuary city and it would not hand him over to immigration officials. Now, the Obama administration turned federal requests to detain illegal immigrants into something voluntary. 
And so many times the policy is just to release criminals back onto the streets, something that has been well documented here at InfoWars and elsewhere. But kind of like this illegal immigrant who was also deported six times, just released right back out on the street. And now he has been charged in a felony hit and run of an Arizona family that injured a mother and her two young children. And there was another case that happened here recently in Texas. It involved an illegal immigrant who had been deported four times prior. And the police say that the man admitted to murdering his wife with a hammer. So all of this has just happened in the last few weeks. And this is, this is just the stuff that we are told about. Because a lot of times the news will kind of leave out that little detail that the person who was involved in the crime was an illegal immigrant. Uh, but here we have Donald Trump making these bold claims. And no matter what you think about, you know, Donald Trump and his bad haircut, kind of the facts are holding up here for him. So he said, you know, Mexico, when they send their people, they're not sending their best people bringing in drugs, crime, rapists. And of course, you know, the media has had a heyday with that because those comments are obviously very inflammatory but they're not inherently wrong. This is according to Border Patrol report itself. Just under three and a half million dollars worth of marijuana has been seized in Arizona this past Thursday alone. And there's also been 40 cases of sex abuse by illegal aliens just this year. And that's just from what Border Patrol has posted as media releases on their website. And a staggering amount of those cases involve children and minors. So however you feel about Donald Trump, you honestly can't refute what he's saying. So it's the truth, and it's not any less true just because you don't like him or because there are people out there who wish to deny the facts. Illegal immigrant deported six times charged in felony hit and run, a family that injured young children still in the hospital. Meanwhile, the San Francisco sheriff defends releasing killer, calls Trump an opportunist. That's the sheriff of San Francisco County that had released the five-time deported, seven-time felon who had shot the young woman, Francisco Sanchez, just did it for no reason, according to witnesses, and then now he says he was shooting at sea lions or it was in a bag, he didn't know it was a gun. I mean, believe whatever made-up story you want. We better just let him go or we're racist. This is how to paralyze people. Now Trump says infectious diseases is pouring across the border. Well, that's true. That's why you got to... Take all the medications when you go down south. I mean, it's just crazy. It's like saying when Europeans came, they didn't bring smallpox. It's just a fact. But now he claims the gun went off accidentally, uh huh, and that it was wrapped up. But now at Trump Hotel site, immigrant workers are wary of him. Well, let's find out if the construction company he's using is employed illegals. Because, by the way, it is a crime in Mexico, big time, to work in Mexico without a worker permit. But that's okay. They're allowed to put illegal immigrants for six months to a year hard labor. It's okay. Mexico has the most draconian immigration laws in the Western Hemisphere because Mexico has some brown people in it. But if America has any laws, we're racist. Let's go ahead and go to the clip of the San Francisco County uh, sheriff, pretty sick. Long before Francisco Sanchez opened fire and killed Kate Steinle on Pier 14, San Francisco's sanctuary city status has been a source of contention. Sheriff Mercurimi says the policy is clear. He needs a court order or a warrant. In Sanchez's case, ICE only asked for a detainer, which the sheriff says under city law isn't good enough. Local governments have the right to require a legal instrument such as a court order that or clown. a warrant. ICE has no city-by-city city breakdown. Torn like but a statewide. In the last third 18 world general months, outfit. more than 10,000 undocumented immigrants have been released from custody in California without immigration officials being notified. And the sheriff tried to turn the table on ICE, saying they are the ones that need to make sure they get it right. If ICE does not provide the proper legal instrument, they are jeopardizing also the city's ability to, that to detain fop. somebody That's enough. against Shut him their up. will. That is, that is sophistic baloney. They gave them the instrument. You were supposed to under federal and state law, but you have a city law that no one will sue to reverse in 800-plus cities that you release felons, rapists, killers, 
who over and over again because they're an illegal immigrant. Oh, you'll turn a citizen over when they've been incarcerated for a state issue if there's a federal felony for something, but not if it's an illegal. So the White House actually blamed congressional Republicans Monday for the death of that San Francisco woman, even though she was shot by a repeat offender illegal immigrant. And they also blamed a spate of gun violence last weekend um, in President Obama's hometown of Chicago on those lax policies, obviously overlooking the fact that Chicago has some of the toughest gun restrictions in the country. And it was the policy of creating these sanctuary cities uh, where th they don't honor uh, immigration detainer requests. So that means that criminals are just released. There's no communication there with ICE and local sheriff department and all of that. So this is a big problem. But, you know, they don't really want you to look at that. They don't want you to know that they're releasing illegal alien criminals out into the streets. Meanwhile, a Marine Corps veteran is facing life in prison for growing medicinal marijuana plants when he lived in Oklahoma. These are plants that he relied on to treat severe PTSD. Now, that's coming up later in the show. We're going to have an in-depth report about that. That's infuriating to know those facts. But first, it has been 10 years since the worst terror attack took place on British soil. We have bombs ripping through three tube tunnels and blowing up a bus, killing 52 people, injuring more than 700. Now, these attacks were carried out by four bombers that were linked to Al-Qaeda. Alex Jones went to the UK immediately following these attacks, and we're going to uh, just give you a little bit of a flashback here with Terror Storm. Let's fast forward to the horrific attacks of 7-7 in London. Prime Minister Tony Blair, leader of the Labour Party, was facing an uphill battle in parliamentary elections. National polls showed that his pro-war party was sure to lose. And then right on time, the bombings of 7-7 and 7-21 occurred. Within days of the London bombings, evidence began to emerge indicating Western intelligence agency involvement. I traveled to London from Austin, Texas to personally investigate. Once I arrived, I was met by Paul Joseph Watson and his brother Steve Watson, who are reporters for my news website, PrisonPlanet.com. <laughs> to understand the London bombers and who perpetrated them, you first need to look at 3-11-2004, the bombings in Madrid, Spain. Years after the blast that rocked trains in the city of Madrid, Spain, the government admits that Al-Qaeda had no connection to the attacks. Every one of the supposed bombers had intimate links to the Spanish security services, including the head of their bomb squad. The alleged leader of the bombers, who reportedly gave dynamite to the terrorists, was connected to the Madrid bomb squad. And we see the exact same earmarks, the same M.O. in the London bombings that we witnessed in Madrid. On the morning of July 7, 2005, three trains and a city bus were ripped to pieces when four military-grade explosive devices detonated. At 8.50 a.m., three explosive devices simultaneously detonated on three separate trains. Within minutes, eyewitnesses were reporting to the press that there had been multiple terror attacks. Despite the fact that three train cars were burning wrecks strewn with dead and dying Londoners, 
Scotland Yard for over an hour and a half claimed that all of the disruptions were simply caused by a power outage in the London Underground. Power surge on the Underground. That's a weird. Um, I mean, the bus was about an hour after the, the Underground, so that's when I think everybody knew that it wasn't it wasn't what it was. You know, I think it was just an excuse. Power surge, whatever. Why would they say that though, knowing it was? They're trying to cover up, probably. You know what I mean? So there wasn't no panic, and everybody sort of like just get on with everything. You know, so. Then mysteriously, 50 minutes into the attack, the London Police Department orders the number 30 Hackney to Marble Arch bus to leave its normal route and to park at the corner of Woburn Square and Tavistock Place. At 9.47, a fourth bomb detonates, killing 13 civilians and injuring many others. Note, out of several hundred buses in service that morning, it's the only bus that the police take special control of and direct to Tavistock Square. I've been walking up and down this road looking at the bus stops for a number 30. The bus stops have all the numbers of the buses on them individually. There's no number 30 on any of the bus stops. That's because the number 30 bus was specifically rerouted here on that day. To simplify it, there's no bus stop here. There's no number 30 bus stop here, no. Well, that was in the news that it was specifically diverted here. They admitted that the number 30 bus was the only bus that was directed to a different area of the city. For what reason? Nobody knows, but they admit that. So it's very strange that for no reason it would come down this road when it was bombed. Remember, while all this is happening, the police are on radio and TV telling everyone that it's just a power failure, an outage. Meanwhile, commuters on the bus were listening to other radio reports where eyewitnesses were reporting explosions. The supposed bomber on the bus with the rucksack became panicked and began looking in his rucksack in what witnesses said was a confused and frightened manner. Weeks later, police detectives investigating the case said that all four of the bombers on the three trains and the bus didn't fit the M.O., the modus operandi, of bombers. They bought two-way tickets. They'd played games of cricket the night before. They had good jobs and happy families. One of the alleged bombers was caught by surveillance camera arguing with the ticket clerk about the price of his pass. After Scotland Yard detectives had a chance to talk to some of the eyewitnesses from the bus and the trains, they stated clearly on the record that they believed that the bombers did not know that they had explosives in their backpacks. This was only one of many huge developments in the case that only received bare mentions in the back of the newspaper. The July 29th edition of Fox News Channel's Dayside program revealed that the so-called mastermind of the 7-7 bombings, Harun Rashida Swat, is a British intelligence asset. Former Justice Department prosecutor and FBI terror expert John Loftus exposed the fact that a SWAT was being protected by MI6 and was clearly under their control. A SWAT is believed to be the mastermind of all the bombings in London from on the 77 and 721. This is the guy, we think. This is the guy, and what's really embarrassing is that you, the entire British police are out chasing him and one wing of the British government, MI6, or the British Secret Service, right. has been hiding him. Welcome back. Joining me in studio now is Rob Dew with some updates on the Sandy Hook case. That's right. Uh, we've had two different FOIA hearings uh, up, up at Sandy Hook with Wolfgang Halbig leading the way along with his attorney, Kate Wilson. Uh, so I guess an update off after the first one, they issued some subpoenas and the lawyer actually dismissed four of the people, told him not even to show up, which is incredible that he could do that. Uh, they gave him a bunch of the information two days before prior. They gave him like thousands of pages of emails and stuff, just trying to Data screw dump. with the process, yeah. essentially, not work within the process that's set there for situations like this when people want information. And we had the second um, hearing. And what the biggest thing to come out was is this first clip we're going to get to. And this is from uh, First Select Woman, Pat Lodra. And this is where she's talking about the check-in signs that were behind um, one of the people being interviewed. Mm -hmm. um, you can see Gene Rosen right there, the check-in signs behind him. And so let's go to this clip now, and then we'll come back and talk about it. Directing your attention, please, to request number eight. 
before the signing law, referring to on the traffic sign, posted outside the standing for a legislature on 12 14 2012. Do you see that? Yes. Right. Are we able to locate a copy of the signing law? No. Do you know whether or not the signing law was placed on the traffic sign by the county detail? It was not. Right. And was it ever given to the county detail? It was not. No further questions. So there's, let me understand, there's a sign in, there's a, there's a, a sign, a flashing sign that says, everyone must check in, but the town didn't put it there. Who do you think put it there? I believe Homeland Security put it there. Okay. All right. So that is definitely the biggest revelation we've had mm -hmm. so far, that Homeland Security somehow was involved. In the history of Homeland Security, they've never gone out to a school shooting, as far as I know. Now they're setting up everyone must check in signs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, but they don't have the list. Right. Later on, we're going to go to another clip about the porta potties because suddenly these porta potties appear. Nobody knows who ordered them. Nobody knows who paid for them. Uh, Wolfgang calls the porta potty company. He gets calls back. Don't harass the porta potty company. But uh, before we get to that, Dan Badandi actually met with my uh, uncle who happened to go there. He was probed by somebody else saying, hey, why don't you? go check this out. So he's not getting paid by anybody, um, you know, to investigate this out of his own curiosity, out of what's going on. He went up there, he looked at information and, you know, here's what he said. And uh, what do you think? Uh, you witnessed the whole hearing here. Was you here last time too? No, no. No, but being here today, what did you think of the whole thing? Very strange. Yeah. Very strange. Very strange situation. Yes. Yeah, no, so what do you expect to come out of this? You think they're going to try to cover this up or is this going to go anywhere? I really don't know. I've never seen anything like this yeah. before. So my uncle's retired FBI, former Navy SEAL, uh, Naval Academy graduate. Okay. The guy's not stupid. Very right. smart guy. Went up there and he's never seen, he's been in court cases. You wouldn't believe, you know, he's a F, retired FBI agent. Um, never seen any uh, court proceeding ever go like this. He doesn't un understand why they don't want to give the documents to the people. He doesn't understand why they don't have documents. He said, this is very odd, especially when you got bureaucracies and, you know, Connecticut, you know, you have bureaucracies entrenched. Mm -hmm. they've, they've been a state for so long. So they have this stuff and you can, you can go through the, the hours of the hearings. They talk about how the school board has every record back for decades, decades, yet they don't have permission slips or anything having to do with this trip that they're taking the St. Hit Choir to the Super Bowl. No mention of it anywhere. Oh, we're just going to send the kids to the Super Bowl. No big deal. You know, crazy. Now I want to play this last clip. Uh, was this is the select woman again talking about the porta potties? And I actually have clips. You can see from the first shot of Sandy Hook, there's no porta potties in the shot. And then I show another still from later on in the day, and you can see two porta potties have appeared in the uh, top of the frame. So let's go to that clip. That is your request for porta potties. We're from Catfield Porta Potties in South Carolina, Connecticut, and particular. Uh, a copy of the bill for installation and use of the porta potties referred to the uh, board for use on December 14, 2012. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, do you know whether or not porta potties were delivered to the area surrounding the San Diego School on 12 14, 2015? I have no knowledge of that. Did the town order porta potties? Time 12, 14, 2012, or any time around that date, the day Absolutely not. Did the town pay for any porta potties that were that may have been delivered to the area on or about 12, 14, 2012? No. And no invoices obviously were received by the town during that period? None. So there you go. Right, and we saw porta the potties whole... just magically appear. You yeah. can see them on the top of the frame there. Uh, the reason I show that white circle, uh, the circle around the white building, is to show this is the same shot, just a different angle of of, of Sandy Hook School. Right. So, and, and we now saw the driveway was all blocked off for the entire day. How did right. they get them in there? Yeah, yeah, we couldn't get an ambulance down there, but hey, we get the porta potties in. You know, amazing, amazing. And now it looks like tomorrow they're going to have the final closing arguments and the decision with the entire. Uh, board there instead of just one board member mm -hmm. there. It's going to be the whole thing. And, and, and I guess we have Dan Badandi on the line to talk about that. So Dan, you've been sitting through over four hours of these hearings. What's your impression of the people of Sandy Hook, how they're reacting to this Freedom of Information Act requests? 
as I said in uh, both interviews with, with Wolf there, wow, that's all you can say. And um, I've never seen anything more dazzling in my life in court cases. And uh, these people lying blatantly on the stand, I mean, they have no clue what the hell is going on in their own town at that or they seem to be that way anyway but i mean it's just it's really crazy that's the best word i could come up with crazy while like i'm basled i really am yeah and earlier today we played that that short interview you did with my uncle um how did you figure out that he was even that he was related to me at that point well after the hearing um everybody met in the uh out, outside in the hallway there and um, he come up to me, I believe he came up to me as somebody mentioned about, um, you know, him, his last name is Dude, whatever. But he came up to me, say, hey, I'm Rob Dude's uncle, because he found out what info was. So right away, he said, hey, I'm Rob Dude's uncle. And um, right away, I shot a quick interview with him. And um, I mean, him himself was the interview. I mean, he's very dazzled over this whole court case. I mean, it's unbelievable. And I, uh, just for a joke, I said, let me get a picture with you and send it to your nephew there. And <laughs> you're like, what the hell are you doing my uncle? Uh, you know, it's yeah, I was I was very surprised to see that. And now after the second hearing, you actually tried to question uh, Chief Kehoe. He he, I guess, recently resigned, like maybe announced it the day before. Uh, what what was your impression of his body language and how he he wanted really nothing to do with you? He seemed to be afraid of you at that point. Oh uh, yeah, I mean, uh, from the first hearing to the second hearing, I mean, he was just. Uh, quick answers. He looked like he didn't even want to be there. He wanted to get the hell out of there. And of course, a resignation comes in uh, the, the night before the hearing. And I, I, that's the first question I hit him with um, is about him resigning. Why are you resigning? Then, of course, I, had, I followed him all the way out and I tried to get uh, answers out of him. Of course, no dice. Uh, st the state police actually uh, grabbed him to put him in a uh, state police car to escort him to his car. And then we went after Monty Frank after that, the lawyer. Yeah, the, now the lawyer seems to have a vested interest in keeping the, whatever the narrative they want to push going. Uh, he's now, you know, running with charities. He rides his bike for these charities. He founded one of them, uh, Team 26 for Newtown. Um, how has he been? Have you Did you try to interact with him at all during these hearings? Yeah, so when I went after Monty Frank, I mean, I was just, just asking him the questions, uh, just regular questions. He did not want to answer. So he's looking at my press credentials, trying to figure out who I am. And I told him, say, hey, we're here to expose corruption. And uh, this guy fits the bill of um, somebody out of Central Casting. And he's a perfect person. He looks like uh, Mr. Burns or somebody from uh, The Simpsons or whatever, running a new nuclear power plant. But, I mean, this guy is out of somebody uh, like out of Central Casting. I mean, this guy is a joke representing corruption. Yeah, and he seems to have more of an interest in uh, stalling the proceedings and objecting and trying to make sure, you know, how big's got every I crossed and T, you know, uh, T crossed and I dotted instead <laughs> of actually fulfilling the uh, FOIA request that he, you know, was asking for because he's representing the town, he's representing the police department, he's representing the fire department, he's representing the entire town there, and everything is going through him, and he just seems to be more of a roadblock than more of, of a facilitator. And he even what told some people who were subpoenaed not to show up. Is that correct? Oh, yeah, the helicopter pilot, you know, for the state police. And it was on record that they provide air support for the Newtown Police Department. And the helicopter pilot was subpoenaed. But the first time, our, um, you know, Monty Frank dismissed him. And this last time, supposedly, he was on military drill. So no. um, the helicopter pilot, I think, personally, would play a key role into this thing. Uh, because uh, uh, Michael Kehoe, the police chief, said, oh, we had no communication at all with the helicopter. Really? You know, when it's on record that they provide air support. So who told them him to go away? Who told them to come there? You know what I mean? And uh, they were doing a missing man, uh, non-wanted um, man uh, report and everything else. And I mean, it's just, it's so mind boggling. And they can't uh, hide their own tracks, these people. Yeah, totally agree. And you're going to be there tomorrow. Uh, we're going to yep. live stream it from, or actually you stream it from our Ustream channel. We'll put out a article with that tomorrow so people can watch. And then you're also going to be shooting some high quality HD footage uh, tomorrow, I definitely want you to get an interview with the attorney, uh, Miss Kay, and also Wolfgang. Uh, a good, strong interview summing up everything that has gone on, including with the decision is going to be, because we're going to break that tomorrow as well. Thank you for joining us, Dan Badandi. Thank you. There's nothing routine about this particular one to me. This one really resonates with me. I wouldn't be surprised if we're sitting here a week from today talking about an attack mm -hmm. over the weekend of the United States. That's how serious this is.
That was a former member of the CIA, Michael Morell, who stated he had a very serious concern that over the 4th of July weekend, the United States could endure some type of terror attack. Now, to be fair, right here in the city of Austin, we did have an attack. A gunman entered a hotel, opened fire, but was promptly killed by police officers. It was more than likely a one-off incident without ties to any larger plot or scheme. And as is unfortunately usual, there were many people also shot in the city of Chicago. And the goal of a terrorist, whether they be domestic or foreign, is to alter our way of life. We often hear that a terrorist hates us for our freedoms. So with all these alerts coming out from the FBI, from DHS, you know, whether it's somebody from the CIA, I'm very curious how safe people feel in the United States of America. Miss, can you tell me uh, what you did for your 4th of July weekend? At work. Okay. Did you want to do anything? If you had any other choice, would you have been doing something else? Yes, I would have. We went to Auditorium Shores. Saw the fireworks. Fireworks. I'm currently on a road trip across the country, and we decided to be in Austin for the 4th. We kind of just wandered around, um, had pizza. It was pretty basic, but it was really enjoyable. Did you hear anything from uh, the FBI alerts and the Department of Homeland Security alerts, uh, their concerns about potential terror attacks on the past weekend? No, I did not. I have not. No. No. Had you heard those, would they have altered your plans at all? Probably not. No. <laughs> yeah. I don't you think so. You felt pretty safe, yeah. Yeah. It's just the news and alerts are so predictable. I don't even watch the news anymore. They talk about what they want you to hear and what they they want you to know. And, you know, they don't know that we know it's, it's kind of like a setup. Like, oh, okay, we're just going to say this. So we can disturb your plans. So yeah, I just stopped watching the news. It's, everything's predictable. A Marine Corps veteran faces life in prison for cultivating marijuana plants while he lived in Oklahoma. Plants which he relied on to treat severe post-traumatic stress disorder. Last year, police raided the home of 33-year-old Christopher Lewandowski, a military father of three who was honorably discharged for medical reasons after serving multiple tours of duty in Iraq and Afghanistan. Christopher's wife, Whitney, reveals her husband fearing liver damage from consuming a massive amount of pharmaceutical drugs was successfully transitioning to marijuana as a preferred treatment. Whitney says he was just using it. He couldn't get any, and of course, we're a military family. We're very poor. We couldn't afford to buy it anyway. So he was just growing it for himself. He was on his way out of the military and just wanted to see if it would help. Police were summoned to Lewandowski's Geronimo residence in June 2014 after neighbors reported him suffering a PTSD episode. Amid the emotional breakdown, Whitney brought their three children to the neighbor's house in an attempt to defuse the situation. Rather than provide the former soldier immediate medical attention, police proceeded to conduct a search of Lewandowski's home for drugs locating six marijuana plants. Police charged Christopher with felony marijuana cultivation, possession of drug paraphernalia, and domestic violence, a charge which Whitney admits to have filed against her husband at the behest of the officers. The former felony charge carries a possible maximum fine of 25,000 and anywhere from 20 years to life in prison according to Oklahoma statutes. Lewandowski's wife, Whitney, expressed the kind of help he got was being tossed in jail. Speaking of help, it should come as no surprise you won't find any at the VA. Post-traumatic stress sufferer, Iraq war veteran Chris Dorsey was told by a desk clerk at the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs Clinic in Georgia that they aren't accepting any new patients. We good? How about you, sir? Be doing a little better if I wasn't here, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, over in the uh, I was on Athens clinic. I lost my job over there, and I need to switch back over here. We're not accepting any new patients. The VA is not accepting any new patients. Not this clinic. Okay. Yeah. All right. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wonder why 22 killers are there today. Good job. This was the second facility Dorsey had been turned away from in a matter of days for his post-traumatic stress, even though it was PTSD Awareness Month. Both of the facilities he visited failed to tell him of special treatment available to him as a part of PTSD Awareness Month. 
My name is Miguel Roberts. I'm a clinical psychologist with the DCVA. I'm the director of trauma services at the PTSD clinic. So PTSD Awareness Month was started in 2010 by an act of Congress that established June 27th as PTSD Awareness Day. And we think that that's important because to educate veterans about the signs and symptoms of PTSD, that help is available. Essentially, the VA the creator of PTSD Awareness Month was unaware of PTSD Awareness Month. Mr. Speaker, today I rise in recognition of the National Post Traumatic uh, Stress Disorder Awareness Month. Nearly one third of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans who received VA health care in the decade after 2001 were diagnosed with PTSD, and the numbers are only expected to climb, unfortunately. As our tax dollars burn in the wind, John Bound for Infowars.com. I was a perfectly healthy person, and the only thing I did differently was get a vaccination recommended by my doctor. And now that I have this disease or syndrome or whatever the heck it is, this paralysis, this inability to have any quality of life, it's hard not to think about the decisions of the Governor Brown and Senator Richard Pan on the mandatory bill they signed into law requiring children to be vaccinated in order to get a public education. It's all about the money, folks. And they've taken away your right, your obligation to look after your best interests in your family. And they don't mind 10, 20%, 15% of the population being taken out in one way or another through their bad vaccines. All right, that was just a little snippet of Poisoned by a Vaccination. That was John Vercelli that you saw in that video. And I'm joined now by the producer of that video, Telly Blackwood. Telly, thank you for joining us. So tell me, how did you get involved with this story? Well, pretty much um, John Bruschelli is my good friend. <clears throat> um, he's a master gardener, and I've been learning from him, you know, self-sustaining vegetable growing and all that good stuff. And it was the whole week I didn't hear from him, and I know what happened to him. And, and finally, I got, I got a note. He was in the hospital. <clears throat> I got a hold of him, and I went and saw him, and he was like 75% paralyzed, and he was just really messed up. I just didn't understand what happened to him until you know, we got news that he got the vaccination when he was able to talk normal all the way and be able to see what happened. Then it was clear that the vaccination almost took him out. And so um, <clears throat> I've already been against the vaccines in the first place. You know, I'm a highly opposed to SB277. I'm actually doing a little bit of um, co-op with Tim Donnelly. I guess it. Um, yeah, he, he just he got, he got really sick from really, you know the GBS syndrome and had a partial stroke. Then I just you know I, I wanted to help, and the only way I know of is I'm really good at making videos. Right. And so I'm sorry. When did this all occur? It happened about three weeks ago. It was uh, I believe it was the second Monday of June. Wow. That is incredible. So just basically someone's life transformed overnight. So give me a little oh, yeah. background on, on John Bruschelli there. Um, John is a, a community figure. Um, he works a lot with schools and families. I was actually responsible for uh, several schools in the Twin Rivers District having salad bars and um, healthy salads and fruits and vegetables in their lunches. Um, he goes to plants trees everywhere and Miss garden happiness for everybody. You know, really, really great guy. Yeah, but it's it's also kind of serendipitous, I would say. I mean, obviously, you know, not a great thing that happened, but uh, mandatory vaccinations just passed there. Um, Senator Pant had a big hand in in getting that all passed, and <laughs> he kind of has ties there with John Bruschelli, so kind of odd just like a very odd stroke of fate there that this would happen to uh to someone who actually used to work as a volunteer for the senator 
Well, back, back before back before he got into his position by actually lying and having a false address where he could even run for his position. So right off the bat, he was already fraudulent. Mm-hmm. Um, he was actually a volunteer for um, Dr. Pan, you know, just before he got elected, and he worked a lot with the pediat- helped a lot with um, reestablishing the pediat- pediatric system here in Sacramento. Mm-hmm. Um, he was involved in <laughs> a lot of good wholesome stuff. And after Pan got elected and got his funding from Big Pharma and the university, who you know pretty much bought his election for him anyway. Mm. And you know, down the road, a couple of years later, and here he is, half dead, you know. Yeah, and so tell me a little bit about what happened. What was the the vaccine that he took, and and a little bit about that. I mean, because this was just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, originally I thought it was the TDAP. Mm-hmm. Um, from what we've seen, it was just a three in one, the whooping cough, um, tetanus, and something else I can't pronounce. That was the that was the main vaccine he got. Um, he had gotten on the Monday. He was the doctor. He just got done with his physical. He just got his lab results back. Everything was, you know, a very healthy, you know, man. Mm-hmm. And doctor suggested, hey, let's get this, you know, get this shot. You need it. And he, he was very reluctant to get it. And doctor said, it'll be okay. No problems. Look at me. I'm fine. He took the shot. Then four days down the road, he started getting, you know, from the point of injection, started getting feeling more and more sick. By the fifth day, um, he was starting to collapse and losing his feeling in his body, his legs, his arms. Wow. Um, by the seventh day, he was, you know, paralyzed, totally paralyzed in the hospital. Um, half of his face was drooping like Rambo, you know. It was, just, it was all bad. Wow. And so this is, that's kind of a very common vaccine. I think it's mandatory for people that are going to be working in hospitals and things like that. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, also he was, he's on, you know, has state disability. So I think it was, I'm not sure if hundred percent if it was a requirement or not. Mm-hmm. I'm really surprised based upon, you know, me and, me and him already have active, you know, active, I <laughs> can't see the word, activism background already against this. Mm-hmm. So I was really kind of surprised that, he actually took the vaccine. Right. Oh, my goodness. I mean, yeah, someone that's already very actively a, an opponent of this. So obviously, they're in California. They just passed SB 277 and it's mandatory vaccinations and um, a lot of support. You guys are getting a lot of support there from the activists, uh, but some pushback as well. So what's been the response from the hospital? Has anyone from Senator Pan's office tried to get in contact with you. I had I had one phone call, which I was able to trace back to um, UC Davis here in Sacramento. It was pretty much a quick call telling me to take the video down, or they're going to sue me, which I thought was pretty funny because I don't have much to sue for anyway. But <laughs> um, that was only part of my part. Of course, I had Facebook hate haters and Twitter haters and the usuals and trying to throw up their CDC science and excuses while they're ignoring the huge amounts of people are suffering injuries. Yeah. Ranging from autism to GPS to, you know, who knows? Yeah. And it's right there in their face. Some, this happened to your friend who is an adult, perfectly healthy adult who is obviously very conscious of, you know, eating organic food and things like that. And then now we have such a, a frightening authoritarian bill be passed right there in that same state where people are questioning how can parents have any concern whatsoever for their children? And these are young children who don't even have a you know healthy immune system at this point, haven't even built up their immunity. And then you see this happening to a grown a grown man. It's just terrible. So yeah, you, yeah I really had to hop aboard to fight. You know, not only has happened to my you know one of my closest friends. You know, I'm going to be a dad at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. You know, I've already had kids prior that are all grown. I'm going to be a dad again at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be a cold day in oblivion before anyone puts one of those things near me or my child. Yeah. Oh, that's just so frightening. I can't, I can't imagine being in California right now. Well, just one last question to kind of wrap it up. I know you said you've got some, a big video that's about to come out um, with even more hard-hitting information, if that's possible. And one unique thing about his case that not too many people have is the doctor's and his, you know, primary care people actually said and believe this was caused by the vaccination. 
you know, a lot of, a lot of times where they don't, they're not to link autism and other things to vaccinations. But this one case, it, it, Dr. Linked it. Wow, they can't deny it. And talk to yep. me just quickly about the video you've got out today. Yeah, he's um, he's working pretty hard. I put out um, a little video of his rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. um, he's actually standing, walking on bars with assistance, of course. But um, he wasn't supposed to even be able to stand up before he left here. Over at Sutter Medical here that had been on media lockdown um, a couple days ago, they were getting mass phone calls from media all day trying to get a hold of John and get you know, interviews on the case, but they didn't totally denied they're banning cameras inside of here. So um, when we came here yesterday, there was about three local um, broadcast vehicles out front. Wow. So the media has been lurking around trying to, I heard anything on the news here locally just yet, but I know they're, they're trying to get the info. Well, Telly Blackwood, tellyblackwood.com. Everybody, make sure you go check out this video, share it with your friends, share it on Facebook, on Twitter. Get the word out there. Let people see that there are repercussions sometimes with vaccines. Yes, it's very rare, a very rare instance, uh, but it does happen. Telly Blackwood, thank you so much for just, you know, making the effort to make a story out of this and tell this man's story so people can see for themselves, you know, what could possibly happen. No problem. I'm just getting started. That's it for the show tonight.